know it's early in the morning, but I think you can all do just a little bit better than that. I said, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Very good, very good. Well, my name is Ronan, and I am from the Science Museum in London. Put your hand up if you have ever been to the Science Museum in London. Oh, very nice. Well, guys, if you have been, please come back and see us. If you haven't been, find yourselves in London. Please come and see us at the Science Museum. We're based in South Kensington. We have all manner of amazing things to see and do at the Science Museum. You can make magnets float, you can blow things up, you can see the Apollo 10 capsule that went into space. Lots of really awesome things. And the best thing about it is that it's absolutely free, which means you pay nothing, you come to the Science Museum and just enjoy all the great things we have on offer there for you. Now, I haven't come alone. I have brought a friend with me. Uh, she's sitting over here. This is the lovely Susie. Everyone say hello to Susie. Hi. Hi. And uh, we have come up here today uh, to do a show for you called It Takes Guts. Now, what does that mean? Firstly, it means you're going to need guts to sit through this show. In this show, we are going to be diving into the nether regions of the human digestive system. It's going to get gruesome at points. However, I must say, guys, there's no shame. We're all the same. We all look the same on the insides. But if by chance you do feel slightly nauseous, uh, please don't throw up on the head of the person sitting in front of you. <laughs> or the lap of the person sitting next to you. If you do happen to feel slightly queasy, uh, signal one of your teachers and take yourself off. Uh, to uh, your nearest bathroom or you uh, can be set that. Okay, well there we go. We've gone through uh, our little warning for the show. Oh, another thing is, I might say, in the show I will be needing volunteers. <laughs> and I can see some of you have got the right idea. If you would like to volunteer, we'd love it if you would place your hands nicely up in the air. If you shout at me, 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 choose me, <laughs> I won't. <laughs> but, if you place your hand up nicely, hey, you never know I'm there. Okay, rats release their energy very slowly. Carbohydrates generally release their energy very quickly. You'll find that uh, athletes, uh, very high-powered athletes, before they actually are, are competing in an event, maybe a good couple of days before, they'll actually start eating lots of carbohydrate. It's called carbo-loading. And the reason they're doing that is so that when they're actually running their race or they're competing in their event, they have all this carbohydrate in their bodies which will be able to release its energy very, very quickly and give them that extra edge when they're actually competing. Now, carbohydrates are great. Um, as I said, they provide the body uh, with lots of, uh, of quick energy. However, too much carbohydrates are bad because if you don't use that energy, that carbohydrate then gets turned into fat and gets stored in and too much fat is a bad thing because it can place a strain on your heart and various other things. But uh, let's uh, try a little experiment. Over here, in this rather intriguing looking device over here, I have some cornstarch. Now, cornstarch is a, an ideal carbohydrate. I am going to attempt to release all the energy stored in this uh, cornstarch carbohydrate at once. And I'm going to do that with the help of my trusty blowtorch over here. So I'm going to light the blowtorch. And we can have a light down for this one. And uh, now I'm going to have a pipe in my mouth. So you guys are going to have to give me a countdown. Should you be able to give me a countdown from five? Are you ready? Start. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. I think that gets around. <laughs> carbohydrate very quickly, much the same way as our body actually releases the carbohydrate. Uh, now, moving on, let's talk about proteins. Now, proteins really are the building blocks of the human body. A ham sandwich or chicken sandwich you had a, a couple of days ago is now actually part of your muscles, part of your skin, part of your internal organs. We find proteins in things like meat, fish, eggs, dairy, and protein, as I said, is very, very important. Your body is almost completely made protein. Now, uh, if uh, you do not get enough protein, fats, or carbohydrate in your diet, this could possibly happen to you. Now, this is quite unfortunate. This young lady here is suffering from an eating disorder called anorexia nervosa. It means she stopped eating fats, 
she stopped eating carbohydrate and she stopped eating protein. Now her body wants energy. Her body needs energy. So she's used up all the fat in her body, so she's got no more insulating layer on her body. That's why she almost looks quite like almost like a skeleton. So she's got no more fat in her body. She has no carbohydrates in her body for energy. And so what her body has started to do is her body has started to eat itself. It started to eat all the protein in her muscles and around her vital <coughs> organs. Now, if she did not start eating a healthy diet, she could become very sick indeed and could potentially die. Now, also, quite an interesting thing, you might see she has this fine layer of uh, hair on her back. Now, this is one of the lesser known side effects of uh, anorexia. When you starve your body to this amount, your hormone levels become all funny, and you actually start sprouting hair in places that you don't generally have hair before. So, uh, it's very important uh, to eat a healthy and well-rounded diet. You wouldn't want to end up like this before uh, young lady. Yeah. Moving on, let's talk about vitamins and minerals. Now, it's fair to say the human body is a complex chemical process in motion. All the chemical processes, and literally hundreds of thousands of those chemical processes, processes are happening all the time in your body, they require vitamins and minerals to take place. In fact, let's give you guys a little bit of a quiz to see if you know your vitamins from your minerals. Here we have some rather jolly looking oranges. Put your hand up if you can tell me what vitamin oranges are rich in. Yes, young man. Vitamin C. Brilliant. It is, of course, vitamin C. Vitamin C is very, very, very important. If you do not get enough vitamin C in your diet, you may end up looking like this. What are you smiling at? Now, uh, unfortunately, this person here is suffering from something called scurvy. And it's the same kind of scurvy sailors used to suffer from in the 17th and 18th century. When you're at sea for many, many months, you obviously don't have access to fresh fruits and things, and you get uh, scurvy. You don't get enough vitamin C in your diet. Very nasty. What happens is your gums begin to recede away from your teeth. You get all sorts of sores and boils in your mouth, and, and this person's breath probably smells quite bad as well. Eventually, his teeth will probably start dropping out. Another side effect of scurvy is uh, your head and your body, instead of growing out of your body, it grows out, but then it actually corkscrews back into your skin. Now this can be very tricky because when you take your clothes off, this corkscrew hair gets caught on your clothes and you start ripping off chunks of your own skin when you take your clothes off. So it's, it's a pretty nasty thing to have. So it's very important you eat a lot of uh, 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 citrus fruits that have vitamin C. Moving on, let's talk about carrots. Now uh, put your hand up if anyone has ever said to you in your lives, oh, Eat your carrots, they can help you see in the dark. Has anyone ever said, who said that to you, young lady? My mom. Now, I hate to say this, but your mom was lying. <laughs> I don't think she was lying intentionally, uh, because there is a grain in truth to what she's actually saying. Obviously, if you eat lots of carrots, you're not going to have x-ray vision at night. You're not going to see your way around in the night. But you need to have uh, enough vitamin A, which is fine as carrots. You need to have enough of that in your diet. Uh, in order for your eye to actually work properly, your eyes to function properly. If you don't get enough vitamin A, you might look like this. Now, this person here is suffering from something called night blindness or nycoloptia. Uh, they don't have enough vitamin uh, A in their diet, and basically this thin film, milky film, has grown over their eye. Now this person, if they were outside, they'd be able to see the difference between light and dark. But if they came into a hall like this, or it's relatively good, this person would be completely blind and wouldn't be able to see anything. And if they didn't actually start getting enough vitamin A, they would eventually cause permanent damage. So it's very important to get enough vitamin A. Moving on, calcium. We all know uh, milk is rich in calcium. Calcium is very important for good, strong bones and healthy teeth. That's why it's so important for young kids to drink lots of milk. But it's not just important when you're a child, it's important you get enough calcium in your diet throughout your life. Because your bones, believe it or not, have very small holes in them. Your bones are designed like that so that they're not so heavy. Because if our bones were just solid, it would be very heavy carrying our skeletons around. So your bones actually have very small holes in them. If you do not get enough calcium in your diet, these holes get bigger and bigger and bigger until they almost look like a crunchy bar and they're able to be broken very easy. And you might get this. This is called osteoporosis or brittle bone disease. Now, osteoporosis is particularly nasty. If I had osteoporosis and I was just walking around and I, by accident, bumped my hand like this on the table, just me bumping my hand on that table could potentially break every single bone in my hand. 
and my hand would never get better. My bones would never heal because there just wouldn't be the calcium in my body to heal my bones. So very important, you get lots of calcium in your diet. Moving on, who can identify this green leafy vegetable here? Yes. Is it lettuce? It's not lettuce, no. Yes. Radish. It's not radish, no. Spinach. Spinach. Well done. Very good. Spinach. Now, spinach is rich in something. It's rich in a type of mineral, a metal, really. Does anyone know what metal I'm talking about? Yes? It is indeed. It is iron. Now, uh, iron is very important in the human diet. In fact, the reason why your blood is red is because of the iron in your diet. Uh, uh, what happens is the iron helps uh, bond to the oxygen and transport it around your body. If you do not get enough iron in your diet, you might look like this. Now, this uh, lady here is suffering from something called anemia. She doesn't have enough iron in her diet. And uh, so what's basically happened is developed anemia. Her lips have gone this bluish, bluish tinge, the skin on her tongue has kind of started to peel off. Her. And she feels weak all the time because she's not getting enough oxygen around her body. In fact, She's feeling so weak, she hasn't even had the energy to pluck the hairs growing on her chin. It's quite sad. Um, hands up if you can tell me how old you think this lady is. How old do you think she is? Any guesses? Uh, yeah? 60. 60. Anyone else? Yeah? 70. 70. Yeah? 90. 90. Would you believe she's only 22? I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> I, I don't know how old she is, but whatever age she is, you don't want to actually look like this. So guys, please make sure you get enough time to die. Okay, moving on, we'll quickly talk about this one. Uh, this is sometimes listed on the nutritional information uh, content table. It's called fiber. Now, fiber is an interesting one because fiber is not really a nutrient. Our bodies can't actually digest fiber. Uh, but our bodies do need fiber because fiber does something very important. It helps bind everything together in our digestive system. It helps give our digestive system a good workout and it absorbs some of the poisons and pesticides that might be in our food. Also, we need water. Now, we can live possibly months without food. We can actually only live a few days without water. All the chemical processes in the body require water to take place. So it's very important you drink enough water every day and keep yourselves hydrated. Right. We've gone through the nutrients, it's time we got into the human digestive system. So, where do we start our journey? Where does food start its journey? Where do we take food into our bodies? Yes? Your thingy mitig? <laughs> Not sure I know what that is, your thingy mitig. No, no, but before we get to the thing, I know what you're saying, before we get to the thingy mitig, we have to take it in somewhere else. Yes, you know? That's after. So come on guys, where do we take food in? Yes. Do we take food into our stomach? Well, get in there food, even before that. The mouth, very good, of course. It's the mouth. Now, it's at this point I am going to ask two volunteers to come up here and join me for some, some brunch or a, a late breakfast. Who will join me for brunch? You look back and join me for brunch. Yes, young man. Yeah. yeah. You. Yeah. Up you come. And I've got a young man and a young, young lady. All right, young lady. Yes, you. Down you come. You. Down you come. Let's give them a round of applause. Oh, no. Let's say, no, no, no. You, 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 I was pointing there, yeah, down you come, sorry about that, down you come, down you come, hard to point for people out there, hello, what's your name, nice to meet you, Jake, your name, young lady, we've got Jake in there, well, thank you for joining me for brunch, I'm so excited, now, uh, to start off with uh, our brunch, I thought, uh, Jake and Leah, you guys could feed me, could you be up for feeding me, I didn't actually eat breakfast this morning, so I'm ravaging so uh, I thought you could start off by uh, feeding me some bread. So I've got some lovely bread over here. I'll give some to you there. Some to you, Jake. Now, uh, this is what I would like you to do. I'd like you both to stand over there for me, face me over here. Very good. Now, basically, how you're going to feed me is I'm, I'm going to <coughs> get down over here. I'm going to open my mouth. And what I would like you, Jake and, and Leah, to do is just to, to pop little bits of bread into my mouth. Like you were, like you were feeding the ducks. You were feeding the little ducks. Okay, I'm, I'm ready. Feed me. <laughs> feed me. Oh, oh, feed me. I'm hungry. Feed me. Oh, feed me. Feed me. Oh, you know what, guys? This is 
just not going to work. You know, I've got a big mouth, but it's not quite big enough, I think. So, we are going to have to use this mouth over here. So, Jake and there, if you can come over here, and if you could just break up the bread and pop it into the really big mouth over there. So, we'll get this over here, and we'll pop this in there as well. Right, very nice. So, uh, while they're doing that, I thought, uh, why just have bread? Let's have something with our bread. Let's have some beans. Beans are full of good things, fiber, iron, some protein in beans. Uh, in fact, beans, beans are good for the heart. The more you eat, the more you... Very good. So, let's have some beans. I'm going to have pour some of that. Beans, they're good, but let's have something else. Let's have some sweet corn. Sweet corn's great. Guys, have you ever noticed with sweet corn, it looks the same going in as it does coming out? You kind of wonder to yourself what the point of eating it was in the first place. But anyway, let's have some beans, lots of fiber and beans. Fantastic. And uh, how about a banana? Yeah? You want the hot dogs? Okay, let's... Who likes wieners? Now, uh, what about the banana now? We need some kind of fresh fruit. We need at least one of our five of that. So, we've got our banana over here and it's just... Uh, So I think we should have some pretty good idea. But it, it kind of seems it's a bit, bit stingy of us just to s sort of s keep this sort of chocolate cake all for ourselves. Would anyone like a taste of the chocolate cake before we, we put it in? Would you like some? Would you? <laughs> no? Not anymore? Oh, okay. <laughs> More for us. Okay. We're going to just place it over here. Just um, Okay, now, uh, we seem to have a problem with all our food now. Our food is just sitting in our mouth like this. <laughs> it's all rather chunky, we've got big bits of bread, we've got spilled bits of wieners and chocolate cake. We need, we need to break this food down, we need to mechanically break this food down. So, what do we have in our mouth to help us do this? Yes. We've got some teeth. Now, uh, uh, I assume both of you have some lovely teeth in your mouth. Give us a lovely smile. Beautiful pearly white teeth. <laughs> lovely, I like them. So now, you guys really come into your own. I want each of you just to, to take a bit of the food like so. Uh, pop it in your mouth like that. Do it around a bit like... Num, 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 num. And then... And then <laughs> Well, I, uh, well, I start some things over here. Come on, chop, chop. You don't have much time. Stop, 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 stop. I was just kidding. I was just kidding. That would be bad. Possibly illegal. I wouldn't do that. No, no. You're very good. I, I'm going to give you guys some salt to so I've got some there for you, and I've got some there for you. And basically, uh, yeah, what I want you to do is just get in there and start mashing the food up. So get in there with things and just start mashing the food up. Now guys, as you know, we've each we've got different types of teeth in our mouth. Each of these teeth uh, perform a different function in helping to mechanically break down the food. But you know something? While our food is being chewed, it's, it's a bit dry in our mouth. But uh, what do our mouths secrete that help us lubricate this whole process? Yes. Yep. Saliva. Saliva. Very good. Very good. So we obviously need some saliva. Now, you're quite lucky. Um, Susie over there is a prodigious drooler. She drools all the time. In fact, you know, we have to constantly say, Susie, you're drooling again. <laughs> So, on the way up here, I uh, was collecting some of Susie's 
saliva, and you wouldn't believe how long it takes to collect this much saliva in a bottle. But I eventually got enough, and so I'm going to place some of this saliva inside here. Oh, my God. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm like, oh. that after a couple of minutes or so, the bread actually starts to taste sweet. And the reason that's happening is the enzymes are beginning to break down uh, the starches in the bread and turn it into carbohydrate. But our food looks thoroughly uh, chewed up there, so I'd like you to give my two wonderful volunteers a big round of applause. Our food here has been nicely sort of broken up. Our teeth have broken it down. The saliva has helped lubricate the process. But uh, we're forgetting something that's in the mouth. Something that also plays a very important role. Yes. You're right. It is, of course, the tongue. The tongue actually has a very important role to play in this process. <coughs> Firstly, the tongue tastes the food like this. Oh. Oh. But your tongue actually does that because your tongue is tasting to see whether the food is good or not. If it's bad, you spit it out. But if it's good, generally the tongue will tell us it. And the tongue also gets in there and it mixes the food up like that. And it pushes it into the teeth and it pushes it around the mouth like so. And it works the saliva into the food like that. Look at that. And really good there. Now, basically, what your tongue does is your tongue pushes the food around in your mouth till you get a nice little ball shape like this. Now this ball shape is called a bolus and it's because of this bolus shape the food is able to pass into the next part of its journey which takes place in this blue highlighted section here. Now who can tell me what the name of this blue highlighted section is? The food pipe no, that's not. It's probably, it's your food pipe. <laughs> and what the scientific name for it? <laughs> yes. The esophagus. Very good. It is your esophagus. But if you like, you can probably call it the food pipe if you're not writing an exam. So, we've got our esophagus over here. Now, you guys are very, very lucky because um, Susie uh, is quite daring in the name of science. And uh, she was kind enough the other day to swallow a small endoscopic camera. So, basically, uh, we are going to now have a look at Susie's esophagus. Would you like to see Susie's esophagus? Yes! Yeah. 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 Oh, look at it. Down we go. <laughs> now, guys, you'll notice the esophagus seems to be pulsing. We call that periostaltic movement. And that pushes the bolus of food downward. Down goes the food, down. Down, down. Oh, oh my gosh. God! What's that? <laughs> this is not what you think it is, okay? We're only over here at the moment. This here is called the cardiac sphincter. Now, your body has lots of sphincters. This is one of the first our food will actually encounter. We call it the cardiac sphincter due to its proximity to the heart. Now what happens is the bolus of food gets to the cardiac sphincter, the muscles relax like that, the, uh, the sphincter opens, and the food is then able to pass through to the next stage of the journey, which is in this blue highlighted section here. Who could tell me the name of this blue highlighted section? This blue highlighted section. Think about it, we've gone down the esophagus. Where are we now? Yes, young man. The stomach, yes, of course. We are now in the stomach. Now, lots of things actually happen in the stomach. Uh, but before we actually talk about that, would you like to see Susie's stomach? Yes! Susie, show us your stomach. Now, here we have Susie's stomach. I want you to look closely at 
that layer of mucus in Susie's stomach because that layer of mucus is doing something very, very important. Also, you can see the stomach has lots of ridges and lots of folds in it. Okay. Very nice. Great. Now, good looking stomach. Guys, as you can see there, uh, I told you there's that layer of mucus there. It looks like lots of spit in the stomach. Now, that does something very important. It exists in all of our stomachs. And basically, that's there because our stomach secretes something very, very strong. Who can tell me what is secreted in our stomach? Yes, young man. Very good. It is indeed acid. And that layer of mucus actually protects our stomach wall from this acid. Now, I've got some acid over here. It's not hydrochloric acid, which is the acid we have in our stomachs. This is a slightly weaker acid. You can't guess what type of acid I'm using here. Yes. Is it vinegar? It is vinegar. Who knows what we call things like vinegar? What type of acid is it? The letter A. Yes. So I'll tell you what, guys, because we'll come up sooner or later. It's called acetic acid. Now, we're going to put some of this acetic acid, aka vinegar, in our stomach, like so. And basically, your stomach is a muscular bag, just like this. So, what I'm going to do, we'll mix that up, and then we'll put our chewed up food into our fake stomach over here, like so. <laughs> Now, as I said, lots of acid is secreted in the stomach, but this acid doesn't just break down the food. This acid actually helps to activate certain enzymes in your stomach. So we have lots of enzymes in our stomach that are activated by the acid. Now, what happens is your stomach is a muscular bag, roughly about the size of a half a carton of milk when it's empty in that adult. But basically, there are lots of muscles around your stomach, and these muscles, when all the food is in there, they start to tense up and relax, and tense up and relax, like so. And what they do is they start mixing the food around in the stomach, with all the acid and the enzymes, and they turn the food around and around and around and around and around. And while this is happening, you get lots of gas being built up. You get lots of gas there, because chemically stuff is being broken down, and also you've probably swallowed a lot of air when you were eating your food. Then, you sometimes get this really bloated feeling. How do we get rid of that bloated feeling? Yes, right at the back there. Beg your pardon? Don't be shy, my dear. Speak up. All right. Say it. You know you want to say it. Say it. Okay, we'll give you a minute to compose yourself. Yes. You fart? No! You don't fart! Not unless you fart through your mouth! You burp! That's right, you burp! Guys, we're only over here! It wouldn't be economical for your body to actually fart this gas out. So, we burp. You burp. You burp this up and you feel much better. Now guys, sometimes you might be feeling unwell, you might have caught a bit of a tummy bug, all the food you're eating. Uh, might be a little bit off or something like that, or a bit too rich for you. In which case, all the muscles in your stomach clench together at the same time and they force all of this partially digested food up out of uh, your uh, cardiac sphincter, up your esophagus and out of your mouth, out of your nose, everywhere, all over the bathroom floor, except in the toilet where it should be going, and maybe if you're very unlucky, you'll get a little piece of sweet corn stuck in your nose and you smell it for weeks afterwards. And we call that being sick or vomiting. But um, don't worry, our food is pretty good here. So our food is now able to pass through to the next stage of the journey. And that next stage of the journey occurs in this blue highlighted section here. And the name of it is? Well done, it is. It is the small intestine. So, uh, uh, Susie, uh, can we see your small intestine, please? Now, there we have Susie's small intestine, and you can see uh, there's no mucus layer in the small intestine. It actually looks quite clean there. There's no mucus layer protecting the walls of the small intestine. Now, this can be quite, uh, quite a bad thing, because remember, you have all the stomach acid in your food still. Because uh, all this food, partially digested food, which we now call chyme, is passing through from your stomach into your small intestine, 
But your small intestine has nothing to protect it from all of this acid in the food, and that could quite harm the small intestine. So, something is secreted in the small intestine, something to neutralize the acid. Does anyone know what we use to neutralize an acid? Yes. Brilliant. It is, of course, an alkali. And an alkali is secreted from the small fish-shaped organ over here. Does anyone know the name of that organ? Yes, my friend at the back. Yes. Is it your liver? Oh, it's not your liver. Not your liver. Your liver is this massive thing over here. We're interested in that one. Yes, behind. Brilliant. It is, of course, your pancreas. And uh, this is what a pancreas looks like, if you've ever wondered. It, it kind of looks a little bit like a piece of kebab meat, don't you think? Well, the moral of the story is, my friends, always be very careful whenever you eat a kebab. You could quite possibly be eating someone's pancreas. Anyway, moving on. Basically, what is secreted from the pancreas is an alkali. And this alkali is kind of similar to our sodium bicarbonate. And we're going to place some of this into our food that's now in the small intestine to neutralize the acid. Now, probably can't see this, but if I hold the food up like this, or no longer food, but kind, you can see that all sorts of bubbles are happening in here because the sodium bicarbonate is reacting with the acid. And you're getting a lot of gas being released. Who can tell me what happens to this gas? Yes. Yeah. You fart. Yes. We are now so far down the digestive tract that to get rid of these gases, it's much more economical for it to come out the back end. So we, uh, in common say, you fart, you break wind, you cut the cheese. Okay, but it's not just uh, sodium uh, bicarbonate and, al and alkali that's released in the small intestine. Something else is also released, and it's released from this small blue organ highlighted here. Does anyone know the name of this little organ here that's been highlighted? Sometimes you can have it removed. Uh, yes. The appendix? It's not the appendix. We'll talk about the appendix a little bit. Something else. Yes. It's not your kidney. You can have one of your kidneys removed. But no, it's not the kidney. Not the villi. It's not the villi. Very importantly, though, we were going to talk a little bit about villi in a second. But basically, this over here is called your gallbladder. Now, what does your gallbladder do? Your gallbladder secretes... Um, Bile salts. Now, can anyone guess what I'm using for my bile salts here? What does this look like? Yes. It looks like washing up liquid, and it's very because bile salts perform a very similar function to washing up liquid. We use washing up liquid to break down the fat and grease on our dishes, and that's what the bile salts do in our body. Basically, they break down the fats in our body because fats don't really dissolve very well in water. So, our gallbladder secretes some bile salts uh, into the small intestine and uh, basically this is what a gallbladder looks like if you've ever wondered. Uh, you can have your gallbladder removed. Sometimes uh, if you eat too much fatty foods uh, you get the buildup of little crystals called gallstones. It's very very painful and you have to have your gallbladder removed. But that's fine. You can live without a gallbladder but it just means you need to be very careful about uh, how much fat you eat for the rest of your life. So uh, there we go. Now in the small intestine, coating the wall of the small intestine, you have many millions of these tiny little finger-like protrusions called villi. Now these villi perform a very important function. Basically, what these villi do is they act very similar to the sponge over here. And the villi, they absorb all the nutrients that have been broken down in the food. So all the nutrients have been broken down and now the body wants them. And so these villi, they absorb all the good stuff. So there we are absorbing lots of carbohydrates and putting it in the blood like so. Then we're absorbing some of the broken down fats like so. Vitamins and minerals. And our proteins. And they'll either be transported to the parts of the body that need them or they will be stored in places like the liver. Right, now, there we have uh, our villi. So now most of the nutrients have been absorbed into our bodies through the small intestine and the villi. Our, what's left of our food, this kind like substance, this partially digested or mostly digested substance, is now able to pass on to the next stage of its journey 
And that takes place, as it says, spraying the screen <laughs> with bits of food <laughs> uh, in this blue highlighted section over here. Who can tell me the name of this blue highlighted section? All right, let's choose someone we haven't chosen before. Yes, right at the back there, young lady. It is indeed the large intestine. Would you like to see Susie's large intestine? Yeah. Yeah. Susie, show us the large intestine. There it is. Now, you can see the large intestine is different in shape, structure, and function from the small intestine. That actually looks quite clean. That's a, that's a good looking large intestine, I'll tell you what. Now, guys, the large intestine has a very, very important job to do. All of the digestive processes that have taken place in the stomach and in the small intestine have actually needed lots of water to take place. So your body wants this water. It doesn't just want to get rid of this water. So what your large intestine does is it acts a little bit like this sieve, this colander over here, and it tries to get or it absorbs all of that water, a few nutrients and some vitamins, it absorbs it back into the body. That's why it's so large, because the surface basically needs to absorb all of this good water back into the body. Now, uh, the larger test, and while this is busy sort of draining, so let's talk about some of the other things you might find in the large uh, test. In the large intestine, you find this little organ over here, this little one highlighted in blue. Once again, it's an organ that lots of people uh, might have removed if it becomes infected. Who can tell me the name of this one? Yes, sir, right at the back. Thank you. Very good. It is, of course, your appendix. In fact, put your hand up if you have ever had your appendix removed. Very good, sir. You can have your appendix removed. Sometimes your appendix may become infected in which case uh, a doctor will have to actually remove your appendix. Now, you're probably wondering, what's an appendix for? The truth of the matter is, is that uh, the appendix, we don't really need our appendixes. Appendixes are what uh, scientists uh, and doctors tell us is what they call a redundant organ. Uh, so it's an organ that they say many, many thousands, hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of years ago, human beings had working appendixes. Possibly when we actually ate a lot more fiber in our diet. Because what appendixes do, working appendixes, and lots of animals still have working appendixes, is that they turn fiber into carbohydrate. So uh, things like sweet corn, the reason why it looks the same going out is because our bodies can't digest the fiber in it. If you had a working appendix, your body would actually digest that sweet corn. Uh, it wouldn't look the same coming out. Now this year is the appendix or cecum of an adult gorilla. Now, and, uh, interestingly, you can see it's much larger because it's a working one. And basically, it helps the gorilla uh, turn all the leaves and grass it eats into carbohydrates. Now, uh, not just gorillas, but lots of animals that have mainly a herbivorous diet have working cecums. In fact, put your hand up if you have a pet rabbit or if you have ever had a pet rabbit. Wow, and lots of people have rabbits in this world, or had rabbits. Now guys, did you ever notice uh, with your rabbit that sometimes if you took him out of his hatch and you put him in the garden, you'd be flopping around in the garden, and suddenly he would do a little poo, he would stop, he would turn around, smell the poo, and then eat the poo. Did you ever see that? I can see some of you are nodding, some of you are nodding. Now, the rabbit is doing that for a good reason. He's not doing that to gross you out. The rabbit is doing that because he has a working cecum. He's, transport, he's transformed all that, to carb, uh, all that uh, fiber into carbohydrate. And he poos it out and he sniffs it. He thinks, hang on, there's still stuff in there that's good for me. And so he eats it. Now, moral of the story is never kiss your rabbit on the lips. And he's probably been eating. Moving on. In your large intestine, you have lots and lots of bacteria. Uh, lots of good bacteria, but sometimes you might drink some bad water, and then you get bad bacteria, and as a result of that bad bacteria, you get this stuff here. What does this look like? Yes. Oh, yes, but you can if you get a very serious bad bacteria. But what is this? It's the same thing that will make you very sick in color. What do we call this? Yes. Ah, ah, I've had an accident. <laughs> what do we call that? Is it the runs? It's the runs. Very good. <laughs> diarrhea. Let's just say it. <laughs> diarrhea. As I said, if you get diarrhea, basically what is happening is you've got some bad bacteria in your system and instead of taking water out of the large intestine, your body flushes water into the large intestine to 
try get rid of the bad bacteria. Now, guys, if you come from a country where you don't have access to clean water, uh, you're never actually going to get water into your system because you drink a glass of water, it's got bad bacteria, the large intestine tries to get rid of that bad bacteria, it floods it out, and then you drink more water, and your body just keeps trying to flood it out, so you're never getting water into your body, in fact, you're losing lots of water, and you can come, become very dehydrated, and, and quite potentially can die. You mentioned cholera, that's how cholera works, is a really severe case of when you've uh, got bad bacteria in your gut. Now, finally, all of our foods, don't worry, our food's good, all of our food uh, was no longer food, it's now just waste because we've taken everything good out of it and it goes to the last part of the journey which occurs in this blue highlighted section here and that blue highlighted section is called... called... some of you know it, so I hear you saying it... called... yes? It's not the bladder, that's uh, for your urine, no, nope, this, uh, this is for the other stuff, yes? It's not the bowels, we usually call our first whole section of that the bowels so it's not the bowels, yes? Yeah? The retina. So? The boom. No, it's not the bum. The bum is the meaty bit around it. Somebody said it there. It is, of course, your rectum. It is the rectum. Now, your rectum is the storage area for all of this waste food. So, your rectum is, once again, a sort of muscular bag like this. And it fills up with all of the waste product. That is now got no more nutrients in it. Maybe a couple of flakes of sweet corn, but uh, now it's just waiting to be expelled from the body. Now, at this point, I'm going to quickly tell you guys a, a very quick story. Come to the end of the show, but it's a quick story involving myself when I was probably around your age. Well, it had been my birthday on the weekend, and I'd gone out, my parents had taken me out, and uh, I had a lovely meal at a lovely restaurant, and I had a burger and chips and an ice cream, and I ate, 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 ate. Anyway, the next morning, it was Monday, I was at school, I think it was after break, I had a maths lesson, and I was sitting in the maths lesson, I was doing my maths, I was writing my maths, when suddenly I got this funny feeling, like that, and I was like, oh. I just kind of ignored it, because I was enjoying my maths, I could actually understand it, which I just carrying on writing, carrying on writing, and oh, I got this other little feeling like that. It was my rectum. My rectum was speaking to my brain. My rectum was saying, oh, uh, uh, excuse me, excuse me, but we're full up now and we need to be empty. But I ignored it. I ignored the voice and carried on writing. So, oh, oh. My rectum was screaming at me, Oi, you, we need to be empty now. So uh, I put my hand up and um, I, said, I said, sir, sir. Please, 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 can I go to the toilet? And what do you think Sir said to me? No. He said, no, you don't go to the toilet in my class. You should have gone to pray. So I put my hand down and I carried on writing. Oh, got a little bit of a cramp there. Sweat coming down my forehead. I put my hand up again and I said, Sir, Sir, listen, if you don't let me go to the toilet, you're going to be sorry. So I think he saw something in my eye, so he took mercy on me and he said, all right, you, off you go very quickly. So I got up from my desk. And I did that funny little coo walk people do. <laughs> but my friends were looking at me, so I was trying to be cool. I was like, hey, how are you going out? That's a place Got to the door, got out the door, closed the door, and then I sprinted with my record down to the toilet. I ran down to the toilet, got into the boys' toilet. I got to the first cubicle, bang, I opened the door, and ooh, ooh. Oh. I don't know what people were doing in their last break, but it's everywhere. It's smeared on the wall. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. I go to the next one. I open the door. I look inside. It's quite clean. I get ready to sit down when I see, oh, there's no toilet paper. <laughs> For a split second, I think of using my sock. <laughs> I'm going to need my sock later. So I, get, I go to the next. I open the door. Oh, and there is the most beautiful. Glistening white, there's double ply, toilet paper there. For a split second, I think I might have gone into the teacher's toilets, but then I kind of see it's my turn. So I sit myself down onto the toilet. I position my rectum over the toilet, like so. Um, this is my toilet. And I position my rectum over the toilet. Now, guys. My uh, plastic bag rectum here does not have an anus. It doesn't have an anus sphincter, so I'm going to have to make an anus with these scissors. All of you have anuses. Never put scissors anywhere. Okay, so. Now guys, for this one, I 
think I'm going to need some help. So all of you are going to push with me. I want to see those faces that nobody ever sees. I want to hear those noises that nobody, hopefully nobody ever hears. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Food starts at the. <laughs> 